thanks for joining. And I know we've got some Ohio Wesleyan students and alums uh, joining us here on Zoom and on LinkedIn. So you, it's great to have you all and look forward to more joint programming in the future. So with that, let me turn it over to Praveen. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Praveen. I'm first year MBA graduate student at Weatherhead School of Management. And I'll be moderating this uh, session today. So yes, let's start with uh, the small introduction from John. So John, if you could go ahead and talk about your, your, your current thing and your journey as an entrepreneur, uh, something about your entrepreneurship things. And yeah, then we'll have questions from the audiences. Well, thanks for being, yeah, Praveen and I had a chance to talk on uh, earlier this week. And um, maybe uh, maybe what's helpful just to, to begin is to share a little bit about my, my own journey because entrepreneurship, I guess, takes different forms. Uh, you know, and I consider some of the things that um, that I've had the, the privilege of doing over the last you know twenty years as a form of entrepreneurship. Um, uh, after I left Ohio Wesleyan, I went to Ohio University for uh, sport, a sports administration, and ended up in New York. Uh, you know, in a kind of a heady time for the internet. Uh, this was kind of Internet uh, 1.0, 1999, and I joined um, I joined uh, a, a business. Uh, focus on sports management, but then quickly shifted to um, uh, starting the economist.com uh, website, the, the first version. They didn't have a website in 1999. So I had the, the honor of uh, starting that business up uh, from scratch and spent four years there building that up from kind of the inception to, um, to a meaningful part of its uh, overall revenue. And uh, then I got a call from Google in 2003, and you know, really that that uh, shift was about what I saw happening in the digital advertising ecosystem. Again, not many people had a lot of experience in this space at the time, so you know, in many ways, um, I was one of the few people who maybe had uh, a body of experience with a reputable publisher. And had the you know had the chance to come to Google and you know I really kind of describe my my time at Google in, th in four phases. Um, it was a twelve year journey, but it really was kind of four distinct phases. The first one was building up this nascent business called search advertising, which um, today obviously is a multi hundred million dollar hundred hundred billion dollar business. Um, but there were days at the very beginning where we were getting kicked out of meetings where people didn't understand the value proposition. Um, you know, it was text. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't the, the big flashy advertising, but it was highly effective. And so we were teaching the industry how to, be, how to, how to make this transition to performance marketing. And then we bought a company called YouTube. And um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that, but that was 2006. And it was early days of digital video. And um, you know, I, I think you know, we had a part in ushering in this era of digital video consumption and the transition for advertisers from television to just more broad video-based advertising, which is inclusive of online and, and, and terrestrial television. And today, you know, those two lines are completely blurred. You know, what, what is the difference between you watching a show on your tablet or watching a show on your phone and, was, and, and watching it on your television? So in many ways, that was a transition that I had to learn a lot about. Uh, how, do you, how do you go up against a television advertiser? How do you uh, change the product to, um, to, uh, to attract that type of uh, business? Then we bought, so we had search and then we bought YouTube and then we bought a company called DoubleClick, which probably most people don't know what that is. But if, you, if you're familiar with how internet advertising gets served across the entire web, DoubleClick is the, the, the kind of the pipes, the infrastructure that runs all of the advertising across the web. So a lot of the publishers um, that run advertising use DoubleClick. And uh, essentially, what, what we were able to do with, with that acquisition was usher in this era of more data-driven marketing, very, very precise, what we call programmatic advertising um, that leveraged you know, very, very in-depth in, in, in uh, first-party data assets to, to make advertising across the web more, more relevant. And that, again, became a multi-billion multi multi dollar business. And then finally, like, the entire business shifted from, from desktop to mobile, which was a huge transformation. Uh, for, for, for Google. And so again, learning a new kind of um, skill, how do you transition all of our existing products to 
uh, to a mobile environment. So again, th those were some of the kind of experiences. Then I came to Pinterest six years ago and, and uh, I saw some of the raw ingredients um, in Pinterest to go build this up from um, 100 million users and 125 million in revenue to um, you know, today oh, almost a half a billion users and um, you know, next year will be over 3 billion in revenue. So it's been a, a fun process of building up that. I think it's the, the, the key word that I always use is building and learning because each of those phases at Google, the experience at, at Economist and now at Pinterest are all about building something up uh, from its nascency to, to scale. And um, that's what I've uh, enjoyed throughout my career. Cool. Uh, that's really interesting to know how you have seen phase when there was, you had to convince people to, to buy ads in Google and, and now people have been using Google and they're like self doing everything. This is a drastic change from your that era to this. So, yep, we are open for questions and I would wait for people to post questions. And the rule, simple rule is just raise your hand. I will let you know, uh, you can speak ahead. Uh, just unmute yourself and, and go ahead. Uh, Go give a small listen. So, and then ask, ask a question. Uh, I don't see any questions right now, so I'll start with my question, um, which would be around uh, so one of the basic questions is for people like us or people like in colleges uh, right now, and they want to start something. So, what are the basic things they have to keep in mind? Like some some small code, something you have for, for people like us, or or any guidelines, let's just keep this thing in mind when you start and don't just go over fancy things. Do you have something basic for people to follow when they want to start? Well, I'm sure you all know this. I'm not gonna tell you anything that you don't already know, but you always wanna start with what is the consumer problem that you're trying to, to solve in a different way than it's being solved today. Um, and the lens that I take when I think about that is what is the what is the application of technology on that problem? And that's again, that's my lens. It's not always going to be the right lens uh, to think about. When I think about where I invest, um, when I talk to people, like what are those opportunities to apply technology to um, an existing problem? And I think you see this happening, you know, in 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 various industries. I'm really excited about the fintech space, and you see what's happening with companies. Um, like Afterpay, I think they got acquired for $30 billion for just uh, installment, <laughs> installment based uh, uh, fi financing, um, which again is a, a consumer insight about how the next generation of, of consumers, younger consumers wanna pay. They don't, they don't use credit cards as much. Um, and so they wanna have these options to pay over time. You know, you're going to you're going to see a proliferation of those type of services. I think the application of technology to to um, uh, healthcare and life sciences is uh, hugely uh, interesting. Again, an industry that really hasn't seen a ton of innovation before recently by applying technology to improve the cost, the, the patient experience and improve improve outcomes is another uh, example. And now you're seeing this kind of happen in other categories like. Um, climate change, climate tech, and how can uh, the application of technology on top of that industry help solve some really big problems that we have? So again, it starts with the problem that you're trying to solve. My lens is usually, you know, what is uh, the application of technology on top of that? Sure. sure. So uh, we have a question from Suzanne. And Suzanne, if you would like to unmute yourself, introduce, and then go ahead and ask a question. Hi, Suzanne brady Kelney. Um, I'm a professor in the School of Medicine, and, and I'm interested in what you mentioned about biotech um, and uh, healthcare. But you've seen so many transitions. What's the next major transition you see in the industry or, as you mentioned, maybe healthcare? Well, you know, again, um, I think the biggest transition where you see the most money going into right now and the kind of the most emerging area is climate technology. Um, I've gotten involved with a couple of, of, um, of funds that are trying to solve these problems in just really bold, audacious ways. And I just think there's, um, there's a lot of money flowing into this. There are, there are, there's kind of a trend where you see every company having to um, both talk to their employees and their investors about what their carbon neutral strategy is. And you can see the commitments that companies are making in the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years about addressing the, the, uh, their footprint, 
uh, on the world. And I think that's because employees demand this. Employees want to work at places that match their personal values. And increasingly, you're going to see investors start to demand this also. They're going to start asking those questions. So you see kind of chief sustainability officers start to spring up at companies. Um, and I, I think this is the next big the next big trend. I, in healthcare, I, I, I'm, I'm probably out of my depth here, but I feel like there's been more money that's poured into healthcare in the last you know, 10 to 15 years than maybe there has in climate tech. And there's still a lot of room for, for innovation there, a lot of room for improvements in patient outcomes. Um, and just the, the, the experience. I mean, I guess the canonical example we're probably all, all experiencing right now is just the rise of telemedicine and how that just makes it so much easier to, to do the basic things while going to a doctor physically would be something you do for more serious things. So that's a, a very basic concept, but I think um, there's just some really cool things that are happening in the mental health space uh, talk space is an example of uh, how they're rethinking the uh, therapy um, uh, experience where you just get on your phone, you talk to a therapist, you know, in the moment, as opposed to setting an appointment, going to it. You know, when I was at Google, um, we, we were, I was working with the team at Verily, uh, which is the kind of the health tech uh, division. And I do remember some of the experiences that we were starting to build um, at the very early stages. The first one, the first two I remember was, um, one was a, a, a contact lens that could monitor your glucose through your tears. And, you know, this is a 20, the glucose monitoring uh, industry is like a $25 billion industry. There's a lot of, uh, you know, concern. Actually, this will become even more of a problem in America with diabetes. So like this is a, a real problem that needs to be solved. And you know, for people who are pricking their fingers multiple times a day, that's a terrible experience. So if you could actually have a contact lens that was uh, monitoring your glucose and you, you close your eyelids and it was like red or green, whether or not your uh, insulin was proper. So like that was actually a really cool application of a te technology. And then another one was, um, something called the baseline study, which um, was effectively just trying to constantly monitor people's vitals through a pill that you would sponsor, uh, swallow. Again, this isn't commercially available. This was just being tested, but a, a, a pill that you would small, swallow that would be connected to the internet. And basically it would monitor all of your vitals 24 hours a day. So essentially, instead of you going to a doctor once a year when you could have you know, eaten right for the last seven days, you could have exercised and now your blood pressure came down, you know, what, could you imagine a scenario where you know, this technology was telling you that your heart rate is 30% higher for the last four days and you, know, you should go see a doctor in your area and here's a doctor that specializes in this, in this, in this particular practice. Like those were like mind bending examples um, of, of what we could do like really differently in the healthcare space that I thought, um, you know, we talked to a couple of CEOs about this and I think they were all kind of equally blown away if this was possible. Again, there's a lot of, a lot of implications behind it, but there's a, that's just kind of the lens that I think Google took to that problem and, and the lens that still is a, a, an opportunity to take, uh, to, to really fundamentally transform how the healthcare system works. Good to know. So we have another question from Madison Miller. I think that is a question from LinkedIn. If Madison, you there, you can unmute and introduce and go ahead. Thank you. Hi, I'm Madison Miller. I'm a senior at Ohio Wesleyan pursuing a double major in marketing and psychology. And I'm actually also a member here at the Entrepreneurial Center with my nonprofit. But I am so curious. We've talked a lot about transitioning an industry. And with your extensive experience from taking Google from desktop to mobile, and even with YouTube and watching everything move with video consumption, my question for you is about Pinterest. And I've noticed a few added features here in the recent updates revolving around a consumer's love for short video consumption. So with that being said, what's next for Pinterest to compete with other social media platforms that have capitalized off of that feature? Yeah, well, it's very astute of you, Madison, to have, to have uh, noticed that. Um, it's it's uh, it's actually an interesting kind of journey that we've been on. Um, and you know what I would say is that the way that people use Pinterest in the past, it really started as a place for 
our founders um, to collect things across the web that they found interesting and then put them onto boards that um, represented their interests and represented things that they either liked or they wanted to do. Um, and they wanted to save those ideas for the future. And so over time, we've, you know, again, built the service up to uh, nearly half a billion people who are saving billions and billions, hundreds of billions of pins onto all, nearly 10 billion boards. So we have this kind of huge collection of first party data and first party um, experiences that people are curating. Um, and we kind of call it our taste graph. It's like, it's the, it's your personal taste. It's your personal preferences. And we know more about you based on what you're pinning and saving on the platform um, uh, to help uh, recommend new ideas to you that you might be interested in, in the future. And so the transition that we're making is, um, you know, the, the way that happened before was that people would curate uh, ideas from across the web. Well, what you see happening today is more and more content is getting published directly into platforms, kind of bypass, bypassing the web, if you will. Um, you can think about this in Snap. Snap has their Discover section where people are, are, are publishing directly into Snap. YouTube has YouTube Originals, and there's all kinds of content that's exclusively available on YouTube. And so what we have to, yeah, and TikTok obviously is doing the same, same thing with original content that's being published there. So what we, what we really th said, we need to kind of empower this, this army of creators to build content for Pinterest. And, and, uh, and do it in a way that's, that's um, congruent with the experience, congruent with what we want people to actually do on the platform. Um, we want them to find ideas. We want them to get off of Pinterest to go do those in their real life. So we're not about just spending time and entertainment and kind of mind numbing things. We want this to be something that you find ideas and our goal is to get you off of Pinterest to go do those things. So we're now empowering media companies influencers, brands, even individuals who are experts to publish on Pinterest at scale with original content. And I think it's one of the biggest kind of changes and transformations uh, for Pinterest in our, you know, our 10, 10, 11 year history to make it really about the creator, the personalities and the content on the platform. And we're gonna be um, introducing kind of new monetization opportunities that go alongside that too. So it's kind of a, I kind of view it as like the last six years have gotten us to this first, you know, milestone, this base camp, and then the next journey is ahead of us with uh, with this creator, this creator strategy. Awesome. Thank you so much. I thought I saw something coming when the watch feature was added. So I was curious to know if you guys were starting to dabble in that video consumption era. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yes. So I think I'll go ahead with one more question, sir, which uh, since we don't have right now anything on the question list. So I think we talked about this in our last meeting. I will just repeat the same question. There are lots of people who, are, who do not come from technology background and they also want to start uh, and they find it difficult. What is your uh, suggestion and what, like, how can they tackle this problem of starting when they are, and you told earlier that what, uh, what to build is something which you can change with technology. So technology is so much needed for everything to today. So what would your suggestion and, and recommendation to those kind of people? Well, again, I think if you start with the problem, you know, the problem, the problem is universal, right? So technology can be part of that solution. By the way, technology doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be everything. You know, that's just kind of, again, that's the lens I'm bringing to the table. Um, but, you know, there are many examples of, of uh, entrepreneurs who are solving problems that don't, don't, that don't center on technology per se, but they just solve the problem in different ways. So don't be afraid of that. That being said, if technology is gonna be a part of that solution, what I would say is there are, you know, it, it used to be that you had to go, you know, have a computer science background yourself, or you need to have a good network of people who you could tap to go build that prototype. And what's happening right now is there's a whole, you know, kind of uh, industry being formed around you know, what they call low code or no code um, services, which really allow people like like me, at least, I don't know about you, but the people like me to build prototypes with uh, without having a lot of knowledge of, of engineering and, and coding. And um, I think this is a really interesting area. Google started to invest in this as well. And um, I think what you're what you're seeing is kind of the democratization of of um, 
of technology builds. And so I, I think it's, it's exciting to think about, you know, being able to do that, even if you don't have that background. So I say, don't be afraid of it because technology is actually solving the technology problem, ironically. Yep, uh, that helps, that, that will help a lot. So I think uh, uh, Michael will have a, another question now. Do you have Great. No, thanks, Praveen. And thanks again, John, for joining us. It's a great conversation. Um, let's talk about the pandemic and what it's meant for your work, what it's meant for the way you hire, the way you call on clients, and sort of as you look out to the future, how have things changed? I mean, we've heard about many technology companies telling folks that they can work from home forever. Uh, many of our folks um, that may live in, in Ohio, be down at Ohio Wesleyan or in Cleveland, you know, that thought of like, oh, what this might mean, you know, could you live in Cleveland and work for the Pinterest or, or, the, or the Google of the world? So I'm sort of curious what the pandemic has meant to your world and, and what do you see in terms of going forward and particularly as it relates to, to hiring and retaining talent? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I, if you would have asked me this question April 1st of last year, I would have told you that this is going to be a huge drag on productivity, a huge drag on the way we work. And we're going to, you know, we're going to have major issues. And what we found was the opposite, was that people were highly productive. Um, we, we found, we, we developed new mechanisms to allow them to be productive through technology, but also just through new ways of learning, new ways of sharing information, new skill building um, in a remote environment. And, um, and we had, you know, one of our most productive best years we've, we've ever seen. Um, so it proved to us that, you know, this notion of being in the office 100% of the time, uh, you know, really isn't needed anymore. And for someone like me who commutes an hour and 15 minutes into New York City every day. Like this was an epiphany. This was a great, this was a great moment. And um, so it, it's kind of changing our thinking, you know, going forward to be more prescriptive about what are the, what is the work that is required to do in person together. And then by the way, there is, still is, there still is a role for the office and there still is a role for people getting together and we started to define what some of those things are. For our world, obviously, if a client wants to meet with you, you know, you got to do that in person, and if they if they want to, um, there's also a lot of like team, you know, strategy sessions and collaboration and whiteboarding that hasn't been effective when in a, in a more remote environment. Um, and then just you know, onboarding and 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 training new team members too. You know, I think onboarding has been a challenge. We've hired hundreds of people in the last um, in the last year, and what I would say is we've improved our onboarding process, but there still is that human connection with the team. Uh, we call them the pod. That pod is a really important unit, and that unit needs to be really close and connected. And so we feel like that's another reason why people would be working uh, in the office. But the direction essentially is that they'll be in the office between one and three days a week. Um, and the rest of the time they can be, um, they can be uh, at home. Uh, I, I think moving forward, we, what we have to really do is define which roles can be done fully remotely. And then what roles are required to be tied to an office because they are connected to a client. You know, that's, that's something in our business that's important. So we've done that step. We've taken that step to say, there's, here's the, the roles that can be done fully remote. There's about a quarter of them that can be fully remote um, and they can live anywhere. And there's gonna be about 75% in a sales organization that will be, um, <clears throat> that will be uh, tied to an office, but only come in one to three days a week. With that, I think your last question around like hiring and retaining, you know, I think this is an this has been an interesting conversation for us to um, say, hey, if people are remote, can we look at skills, not backgrounds, not companies they come from, but the skills that are needed in this job? And by the way, this isn't just remote. This could be for our in you know in 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 uh, office teams too, but it really comes through with the remote employees where. 
we can find people for remote positions in North Carolina or Florida or Ohio. And, you know, and we're tapping into a whole new talent base that may not come from Google because they, don't, they haven't had that policy before, or Twitter or Snap or Facebook, but but they actually have the analytical skills or the customer service skills, and they have the the um, the, the finance skills to to help us, you know, solve that problem. So we've taken a skill based hiring approach. We've changed our hiring profile. We've changed the way that we're recruiting and sourcing people to find industries that might be adjacent to advertising uh, that we can go recruit from. And then once they get here, we've given them an ads 101 training, a really in-depth ads 101 training, all done virtually, um, as well as a 30-day kind of in-depth Pinterest uh, Pinterest advertising um, overview as well. So for essentially for six weeks, they don't they don't even do their job. They just get up to speed on the in the industry and on Pinterest, and then we feel like that's a really good um, launching pad for them to be successful in the business. Awesome. Thanks, Sean. So I just want to follow up on one aspect of my, Michael's question, which is, you know, for our students that are interested in developing businesses, you know, the world is talking about how it's impossible to hire people right now, right? So it's it's a combination of both hiring and retention. And the, the issue seems to be like what people really want to do for a living, right? And Michael talk, talks about this all the time in a series of interviews, but I just wondered what your perspective is on how do you hire and how do you retain? Well, I think, you know, the starting point is, you know, this generation of talent, again, as I was saying before, wants to be emotionally connected to the, to the company that they're working with and for. And so I think the values and the purpose of that company is more important than ever. They, they, need, to, they need to be on that mission. Um, by the way, we all do. You know, that's not just a younger generation thing, but it really, it really um, comes through with that younger generation. They want to feel like they're part of a bigger purpose. They want to feel like there's a, um, an end game that we're, that we're working towards. that's a positive and productive um, purpose and the values of that company match their personal values. And then I think like, you know, they want to continue to be challenged. And one of the great things about Pinterest, at least, is that, you know, we feel like we have more opportunities, more challenges, more, um, more chances for people to uh, address big issues for our business or for our culture um, than, than we have people. So, you know, if you're looking for a place where you can have an impact at some scale, at a pretty large scale, like our, you know, our feeling is that you know, this is a place where you can not only just do your job, but you can also have a broader impact. And um, yeah, and then and then finally, they got to be they got to feel like they're continuing to improve. And so we spend a lot of time and learning. You know, spend a lot of time thinking through the skill based um, uh, uh, training agenda that we bring forward to the team. So that you know, I always say to people like, if if Pinterest isn't the right place for you, we're going to make you so marketable. We're going to make you in such such high demand because you know so much about the advertising ecosystem. You know so much about your customers' business, and and you've got the skills to apply that to other businesses. I hope there's a place for you at Pinterest, and don't get me wrong. Like I don't want anybody to leave, um, but um, but I remember you know I remember Tim Armstrong at Google telling us this too. Uh, who went on to be the CEO of AOL, he said, you know, you're going to be somebody who has the opportunity to do a lot of different things because we're going to prepare you in a way that is going to allow you to advance your career at Google as we continue to grow. And there'll be plenty of opportunities if that's the case. Or if this is the place for you, you're going to be in high demand no matter what. And I feel the same way about my role and our role at, at Pinterest to uh, equip the next generation of leaders for the next opportunity, hopefully inside the company. If not, uh, someplace else. Okay. So we have time for just one more question. Anyone wants to go ahead? I have a question and I post on the chat. Um, um, can you see that? I'm, I'm so Mabel. Um, and I'm an EMBA student with Weatherhead Management School. So my question is about how, for John, is how to, what's your strategy to acquiring your customer for the digital advertising, like for your 
uh, Pinterest most content about recipes and food and lifestyles. So are you targeting those food companies or like other companies for your target audience as a, as clients? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Pinterest, you know, again, historically has probably been really, really well suited for food and home and beauty and fashion, maybe travel um, and a couple of other categories. We're again, with that creator strategy that I described earlier, we're trying to expand the use cases that people come to Pinterest for, for the ideas across every category, because we can be a source of inspiration for um, people across lots of different um, lots of different use cases. But yeah, there's there's a couple of categories that are really uh, areas of strength for us. And so we have a whole um, new business acquisition uh, team. Uh, we use uh, we have a, a large a small business team that, that usually is the source of a lot of our new customer acquisition efforts. And they're on the phone every day talking to small businesses, talking to, um, medium-sized businesses to help them understand what Pinterest can do for their business and what the objectives are that we can help them solve. Um, our large customer segment is more of a managed service type of approach whereby we're already working with them in some capacity. Uh, we're working with every one of the, the, the Fortune 500, if you will. So really that acquisition arm is really dedicated to some of the up-and-coming direct-to-consumer brands like Allbirds or Casper, companies like that. And then also some of the smaller businesses that might be a really good fit for us in food, beauty, fashion, and home. And I should say we've, uh, we've, we've struck partnerships also with companies like Shopify, who you may be familiar with, who you know essentially is running all of the infrastructure for small merchants uh, to manage their entire catalog of products. And now recently they've um, started to strike partnerships with companies like, like uh, Google and, and Pinterest and, um, and TikTok to distribute those products onto those platforms. So Shopify and these partnerships have become a really important way in which we've acquired new customers as well. Because once we have the product catalog on Pinterest, we can, um, we can activate them as an advertiser as well. So it's been kind of a two, uh, kind of a dual pronged approach with uh, our own team acquiring new businesses as well as using our partnerships uh, to identify those those high value uh, high value advertisers too. Thanks for the question, John. Uh, this is from Taylor Gidry. My question is: How are companies like Pinterest attracting consumers that do not have accessibility to technology? Consumers that may have money to spend but cannot afford internet service or cannot or uh, afford a computer or have uh, tech cell phones? Oh, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and honestly, it's probably an area that we have more work to do. We haven't spent a lot of our, um, of our resources to essentially make, uh, make either the, 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 the devices or the, uh, the technology available if, you don't, if you're not connected. I think you know, what you're saying is basically the connection and the device itself are um, you know, are the important inputs uh, to, to driving that kind of usage. I will say that we're trying to, for those that do have access, we're trying to make the product more inclusive of different types of backgrounds and different types of, of um, experiences. For instance, we, um, we launched something called skin tone filters for individuals who are using Pinterest when they are looking for ideas around beauty you know, a piece of feedback we had from our black community was like, hey, you know, I see a bunch of white women on the platform when um, when I come and look for beauty ideas. So we allowed people to put their skin tone filter into the top of the results. And then all of the results would dynamically change to match that skin tone. So it's just a more personalized, more customized experience. And then this last week, we launched the same thing for hair filters. So you could choose different filters based on, I don't have to deal with this, unfortunately, but uh, for people who do have hair, those, those folks uh, can choose what their hairstyle looks like and they can get ideas that match that. So I would encourage you to you know, look at the skin tone filters, look at the hair filters as well. I think that's the angle that we're trying to approach this with, um, with more inclusivity, more accessibility and more personal 
um, uh, experiences on the platform that reflect our audience um, that is on the platform. But I think you bring up a really important point that, um, you know, that accessibility to technology is an important aspect of this as well. It's just not something that Pinterest has, has attacked yet. Well, great. Well, let me jump in here uh, to thank Praveen for, for moderating. We really appreciate it. Um, John, thanks so much for joining today. It was a very thought-provoking conversation. Um, I, too, am an internet 1.0. Um, it's funny when you're talking about your journey. I worked at AOL back in the day, which, of course, nice. my students have never heard of. <laughs> but uh, I know it's interesting hearing the journey um, from your early days at The Economist to Google and Pinterest pre-IPO and, and through the IPO. And um, really appreciate uh, you taking the time. And, and thanks to Glenn and, and all the folks who joined from Ohio Wesleyan to bring all of John's worlds together, Cleveland and, and uh, Ohio Wesleyan. And John, we do look forward next time you're back in Cleveland to have you in person on campus at some point soon. So thanks again for taking the time. You bet, it was a pleasure being here today. Nice to, nice to see you all, go Bishops. And uh, and yeah, go Browns. <laughs>